think Vladimir Putin realized that like this was going to happen? No, no. I I, don't I think so. he walked in thinking it was going to be over in two or three days. Uh, yeah, and then I, several I, weeks later. I think there's a he, whole bunch of intelligence officers who are probably getting tortured right now. Yeah. This is yeah, this is why you don't far fewer than there used to be. Kids. <laughs> yeah. Or the thing resume. is, though, uh, yeah. Uh, the thing is, if in that system, if you didn't, if you didn't lie in the first place, you might not have yeah. survived to yeah. to be tortured now, right? So, I, yeah. Not a not a not a system that breeds trust or success. Which is why everything's ham fisted. Like anyway, again. Oh no, I'm with you, man. If it wasn't for the nuclear bombs, this would be a non-issue. It would be more. If it wasn't for nukes, you know. I I don't. I I honestly don't think they can defend their borders anymore. To be honest, I'm waiting to see if some other republics decide to try to break away. Well, it'll be in the it'll be in the North Caucasus for sure, or Caucasus yep. for sure. If that if that happens, um, I I was just reading this morning that there could be a scenario where, but that's I mean that's a nightmare if that happens because you have the only thing worse than than Putin is no Putin, and the reason the reason that is is you have a loose nuke scenario, uh, which is you know no bueno, right? Not good at all. Um, so, but that's well, the only said, reason. We're also given. We're also currently giving money to the Iranians. The total trust that they're not going to be handing out like party favors to every terrorist organization on the earth. Yeah, they're. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm digressing into global geopolitics again. I'm I'm happy to go there because I will I will because I did my I did my I did my master's thesis on Iran's nuclear program. Uh, um, yeah, but the master's thesis that I did was not. Um, it, it was like you get a problem for a client and you solve that problem. And my client was the, I guess, Nick Burns, who's number three at the state department. And um, I came up with like, you know, kind of two strategies. One was to prevent them from getting nukes. And the other was um, if they got nukes, what, how would we you know, adjust strategically? And uh, like I went through the whole gamut, right? It started with like political sanctions, then economic sanctions, and then military options. But um, the Iranians started following me on Twitter. Like, <laughs> no joke. So uh, there's like an account called Powerful Iran that follows me to, I guess, demonstrate that they have their eye. Uh, I mean, this is back. I mean, they still do, but it was... Uh, yeah, they're pretty. They're they their their intelligence services are pretty creepy. Oh yeah, if they follow me on Twitter, be like, wow, a lot of spicy memes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, it's a it's a weird. It's a it's it's definitely weird. Okay, so now I think we've kind of delved into this. I might as well just finish it. What do you think happens in in Russia, and then we'll go back to the book, like not Russia, but like the next mm. stage of this war. Mm. I, I did the last prediction first. Steve, you want to take this one first? Ooh. You know, I don't know. I, I think if it continues to go poorly, um, there's there's a very real possibility that uh, that Putin could go into hiding or that he could get uh, taken down by his own folk. Um, however, he is pretty powerful. And so you would assume that he has his own connections. I don't know. It's a matter of it's a matter of political convenience. After a certain point, like like at what point does he become too inconvenient for uh, for them to allow him to continue on? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, economically speaking, if uh, if if everybody continues sanctioning Russia and actually sticks to their guns and stays with it, economically speaking, they're going to get wrecked. I mean, it's pretty bad when even China's against you now. Like, is China know, against them though? Are on they? the surface, on the surface, uh, they I don't, are right. I don't trust they're, anything from Z. They're getting yeah. cheap. Of this, is, this is like this is like the cheapest fuel they will ever get. Like, there's every they have every oh, incentive yeah. to skirt this. And so, and so it's hard to know. Um, I, I mean, again, if I had a crystal ball, one, uh, you know, I'd be super rich, and two, I'd be able to to give a little bit better answer than that, but I don't know. 
I, I wish I could say that logic would dictate X, Y, and Z would happen, but as we've already established from from this conversation, from previous conversations, um, there's a lot of people that aren't thinking rationally about any of this. They're thinking about political optics and social optics more than than actual economical and financial reasons. And so, whenever whenever those things start to 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 hit each other and butt up against each other, um, there's even more conflict that's generated rather than less. So I I almost think it's going to get worse before it gets better. So when I make predictions on things, I just the 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 thing I do that makes them the most accurate is I put myself in Putin's head. Okay, so he's excuse my language, but he's currently taking a big bite out of a massive shit sandwich. Mm-hmm. Okay, now what he did is something no Western politician would have the guts to do, which when the Kiev or the Kiev um, advance, the northern operation failed. He quite rightly decided to remove his forces and reposition them in the south. So in my view, he has until May 9th. May 9th is the whatever the great patriotic victory day or whatever they call it um, in the, uh, you know, to celebrate the, you know, the triumph over Germany in World War II. Like it's a huge day. So he has about three weeks. He has to he has to register a big win in three weeks. Uh, what I think he's going to do is he's got two objectives, or three objectives. First, he has to subdue Mariupol, which there's like one steel factory where members of the Azov Battalion are holed up, and he just gave them a um, surrender or kill or, or die sort of ultimatum yesterday, and of course they did not surrender. So. Uh, you know, part one, he's got to complete the the um, you know uh, you know control that city. Step two he, is he has to close the Sever Donetsk pocket, uh, where you have kind of Izium in the north, and um, you know, kind of there's a pocket of of troops that he has to encircle and and destroy. Step three is Odessa, and what that does is strategically that completes or denies Ukraine access to the Black Sea. He accomplishes those three objectives. All he has to all he has to do is come to the table and just keep it a frozen conflict as long as he can starve Ukraine from their trade economically in the south. And frankly the west doesn't have enough patience to play that game, but he can play it long enough. And then he can skirt sanctions by, you know, trading to China and India, um, you know, things for a discount. And over, over time, if he just kind of is able to retain those gains, Ukraine will weaken and he can subvert it by, you know, slowly, you know, changing the leadership through, Influence, bribery, corruption, all those things that he, he normally does. Or or what he might do is once he consolidates his gains in the south, he might try again um, that that thrust in the north, but it'll it'll buy him, it'll buy him some some time. Now, the only wild card is whether or not he can throw enough forces at the problem, uh, given the clear Russian incompetence, you know, whether or not that'll That'll get done. But again, the Russians, if there's one thing the Russians always do, is they always learn. They learn at tremendous cost, right, against the Germans. It was uh, the Germans had a 10 to 1 kill ratio against them in in World War II, but they they always learn. They throw enough people at the problem. The secondary issue is that they don't really have enough people this time. They have a demographic, um, what's the opposite of demographic bulge. And this is about the last time they'll be able to affect something like this. But anyway, if I were Putin, um, that's, that's what I would do. The other, the other thing I would do is um, there would be arms depots that would suddenly explode um, in, 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 you know, kind of in, in uh, certain NATO countries. Cause he's done it before he did it to che- uh, Czechia. I guess that's what the Czech Republic's called now. He did it in 2014. There were and two Czech citizens died um in the you know in the process 
Uh, there's also things you can do in trans uh, um, Dniestra or whatever the heck I can ever pronounce it in Moldova to agitate. There's 1,500, I think, Russian troops there that can that can do something. So anyway, that's that's what I think's next. I think you know what can the U.S. do? You know, if I were the CIA, I would be inspiring some color revolutions in in uh, Georgia again. Um, in Ingushia or you know, Chechnya and those places and and uh, start you know perturbing that part of the Russian Empire I would threaten Kaliningrad you know start bringing some ships nearby make them a little nervous there um, and then I would probably start arming Polish partisans and slipping them across the border uh, and who knows that could be happening but I would be way more aggressive than than we've been. And look, for, I, I, without being political, I, I, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe Biden intends to do that, but he still has to build up critical forces in the region before he tips his hand. So that could also be why um, we've been very, very non-threatening. Because uh, I think we've been letting Putin kind of drive, drive events and are, appear to be afraid of every, every, every time he kind of partially escalates so i don't know what do you guys i don't you know a lot more about the situation than me my concern there is i don't trust joe biden to persecute an actual war or clandestine operation with the dam um or or anybody in this administration i just i mean they're the they're the prom committee i don't i don't see them you know honestly having the the gonads to to, to actually do something like that uh, and if they did, I don't think it would be individuals who would lack the backing and there wouldn't be enough specific focus, mission focus to get it done. I think our best bet is just say, hey, Poland, go nuts. You've got several centuries of ancestral animosity here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you all have fun. Um, no, I don't know. I, I, I agree with what you said about like his focus in the South and trying to like take that and hold it and take it to the bargaining table. I don't know if they're going to have the people to do it, though. I really don't. I think the tables have turned. I think that bar, uh, quality munitions are going to continue flooding into the country. Uh, and I think it's going to be really hard. I mean, they're learning, yeah, but I, if they don't have the population they had in World War II to do the right. turn. Yeah, they're the, exactly right. They've been on a demographic downturn. They've got an aging populace, not a lot of young people. And so all they can really do is they could throw more conscripts into a meat grinder against what will now be a very experienced foe who will be armed with switchblades and javelins and man pads out the butt. Um, and so I don't know if he's going to be able to accomplish anything in the next three weeks in the South to that point. Yeah, they'll probably take Maripol, even if they have to go chemical weapon and just like, you know, scorched earth and kill everybody. But then what? I mean, I think they're just going to get pushed. I think they're just going to get pushed back. I think they're going to continue because, you know, We've not seen any sort of like strategic, like large scale wins on their side, and they push and then they get they get chewed. I I, I don't I, like I said I'm not the the strategist though. Uh, my knowledge of military weapon systems is all the spreadsheets behind them and how much they cost. Yeah, and that's uh, that's my worry in the South too. Is it's like the terrain there is extremely flat. It's like I want to say a moonscape, but it. Um, the reason javelins worked really well in the north is because it's swampy. They had to, you know, there's the raspititsa, which is the mud. Um, you could get within, you could get within range and have cover. Yeah, yeah, and and there's nothing, and and the Russians were confined to roads for a reason. Like if they had moved their tanks out on the side, you know, the sides of the roads, they would have sunk, been you know, literally like little quagmire. Um, and, you know, which the Olympics kind of screwed Putin. He waited for the Olympics to end because he didn't want to offend um, Xi, Winnie the Pooh. And, uh, you know, of course, the, the, you know, the, then the, the ground started thawing. And right now, the, there's I think there's like a ton of rain. They're getting a ton of rain right now, which is also going to slow down any advance because of the mud and, 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 and things like that. That said... In those like broad open spaces, javelins are less effective because, um, you know, in fact, like when I was fighting as the Russians back in 
2001, I fought against the 82nd Airborne where they tested javelins for the first time. So the way that I dealt with them is I would just look at a map in any place where there was a suspected infantry position, I would just draw a four kilometer circle, circle around it. And then I would just avoid it. Anybody who didn't do that, like my peers got slaughtered, but I did just fine. Um, the Russians, again, I don't, maybe the Russians aren't that disciplined enough to, to do that, but um, it'll be a, a slightly different fight. That said, to your point, Larry, the switchblades, that that's going to re- wreak havoc on the on yeah. the Russians. Those um, enough, fine. enough, enough that they might decide to bring us into the conflict against our against our will. Like I said, the big question here is nukes. Honestly, because if it wasn't for nukes, no one would give a crap about Russia. I mean, I see right. these morons on social media, and they're like, "Oh, you just care about this war because it's white people." You know, you don't care. No, it's nuclear friggin' bombs, man. You give anybody nuclear bombs, you give anybody nuclear missiles, and all of a sudden, you know, it's it's an entirely different equation. And that's that's the that's the kicker. And when you start getting Putin said, I can't do that enough, and I'm a fiction writer to do that enough yeah. to say, is that a possibility that he would actually go nuclear? I don't know. If if his regime was threatened, like if we started threatening regime change, which is why. Biden got so much crap for saying like oh, he I should know. be he should be taken out like that's if you give the guy in, in these sorts of situations you have to be very clear like look we are not our objective is not regime change um our objective is for no russian forces in ukraine full stop well, it's funny cuz it's like it's like a, a blessing and a curse that no one takes joe biden at his word <laughs> You know, if you, yeah. if we had a real president, he said we're going to regime change. Like, okay, we're going to have a regime change. Joe Biden says it. We're like, oh, okay, whatever. You know, whatever, Grandpa. Here's your pudding cup. So yeah, I, like he said it in such a way that where I was think he was going was basically, um, or what I think he was trying to say is, if the oligarchs decide to take out Putin, we won't like. We'll you know we we'll, we'll happily look away. Oh, yeah, it's like that's what like Lindsey Graham was saying. It's like, shut up, Lindsey. Yeah, now, but I mean, that's I've, yeah. I'm not in a position of any sort of authority. So if somebody in, um, you know, somebody in Russia was to get sick of this, or some oligarch was tired of losing money and wanted to put a nine millimeter Makarov in the back of Putin's head, I'm not going to cry, you know. But I don't know. Once again, it comes down to if no one, if, if we didn't have the weapons of mass destruction, no one would give a crap. Um, so like, who replaces him? I don't know. That's that's no that's where it gets that's where it gets scary. Think, no, I don't think anybody has any clue on that one. The last um, time I yeah. saw people throwing ideas around was a potential successor just had a heart attack. Um, you know, heart attack. Which 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 guy was that? Oh, what's his name? Uh, Su- 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 Shoigu. 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 Yes. That guy. Like you want to like you worry about new, loose. How that guy? So here's what that here's what that guy did. The reason he's so secure, like I, I thought, like, look, this guy's the architect of this like absolute incompetence. He's the one who organized Russia's um, you know, military renovation or whatever. Uh, you know, which which was obviously did not did not did not turn out very well. I'm like, this guy better realize that he's gonna be the first one who, who gets shot. By the way, no military experience. He's like a civil engineer guy. Who's like the head of the Russian defense department? Like, it's just like we we have a little bit of that here, but like people who get that role are you know been focusing on warfare and uh, you know been either academics for twenty years or or have been executives at Lockheed Martin things like that. Like they have some understanding of how the military works. This guy was like a civil engineer who's running like large infrastructure projects, and in Russia. That's all about bribery and corruption and things like so. He can't be that, you know, th- that suited. So anyway, I thought he would be a target. So I figured maybe he'd be the first one to realize that maybe I should take out Putin if I want to survive. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. But he's not. He just had, so they just announced his heart attack last week. So and he disappeared for a while. Like it, yeah. like he didn't show up until like March 11th or something. So. Uh, and then I think he's disappeared again. So who 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 knows? Like 
I don't think there's, but the one thing he did do is people like that who are utterly incompetent otherwise tend to be the most skilled politicians. Oh yeah. So yeah, it's an inverse relationship. Totally. So apparently they like they had a ton of uh, well-respected generals back in 2014, like the guys who pulled off Crimea and he slowly over time, just like kind of push them aside. So there's nobody, there's like no credible replacement for him because he's already eliminated all these, um, you know, all his competition. So anyway, um, all right. I, I, we went like way over. The, yeah. Sorry. Guys. The, t- the time a lot. No, yeah, no, no. I, the, no, I'm the one who's sorry. For a sec. Sorry. Sorry. I had to go on mute for a sec. I'm, <laughs> I'm getting emails and calls and stuff. And so, um, I, I am going to have to bail, uh, but, uh, no, it's it's all it's all super weird, super interesting. You know, the, one of the things that, that Larry and I always talk about <laughs> is how how real life is is so much stranger than the fiction that we write. Um, except for you know when we happen to have a book come out talking about Russia going to war. So, oops. Oh, look, I, <laughs> I wrote a short story that was on Vice Media about the U.S. like a U.S. Special Forces team in Ukraine fighting Russians in 2017. My I, next, I day, my next door neighbor's kid was on a was on an LBS mission in the Ukraine where this all happened. So yeah. oh really? Yeah. Oh yeah. Tough kid too, but he's currently in Poland now. He he, he got evacuated to Poland. So, so one last story, and then I'll uh, I'll wrap it up because I you know you guys are super busy, and I don't I don't want to abuse my uh, my welcome of uh, you, know, you, you all taking your time to to meet with me. So I have a a friend who you know served in the A Second Airborne, had like three like two deployments to Afghanistan, one to Iraq. He is ethnic you know ethnic Ukrainian. His parents emigrated from the Soviet Union, um, and he grew up in in Brooklyn. He moved back to Ukraine, lived there for a decade. They were about to buy a house in Malin, which is you know in the north, um, along that path of invasion. And um, his, and they ultimately decided to buy in the states. And this was like in December, or maybe it wasn't in December. It was I think maybe six months ago or something like that. And um, his potential neighbor was found hanged. And the the rationale was he was like he owned a few grocery stores and he was a an entrepreneur, but he was also a Russian collaborator. So did he hang himself? Or you know, so there's you're not seeing those stories at all in the media. It's all Russian, Russian, Russian bad. And maybe he did hang himself. I don't know. But I well, do know that there's every a, time there's a war anywhere in the world. Anytime there's war, scores get settled. Old That's scores right. that have nothing, they may or may not have anything to do with the war, but it's an excuse to like cap everyone who you feel has ever wronged you. People forget this. Yeah, this the Iraqis would time. do that. The Iraqis would do that. Like, we, oh, yeah. the, the U.S. forces would ask for intelligence and it'd be like, oh, yeah, like those guys, definitely Al Qaeda. Definitely Al Qaeda. No, it's, the, it's the, his grandpa stole a goat from the other guy's grandpa, like yeah. straight up. I mean, it always happens. And yeah. it, it happened in Western Europe too. This is not during World War II. It, we we saw a lot. It happened all over France, mm-hmm. you know, and it's stuff that had nothing to do with the war. Oh yeah, that guy totally a Nazi collaborator. You know, it just that guy just, just you cap everybody who's ever wrong. That's what happens. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, thank you, gentlemen, for uh, spending uh, time time with me. I really appreciate it. And you know, where, where can every where can folks find uh, servants servants of war and and also websites and things like that? Should what, what websites should people check out? Um, I know the the answer is self evident for you, Larry, but yeah, I figured ahead, I'd ask anyway. Oh, uh, you know, um, you can find me on on Twitter um, if you, if you feel like it. When it comes to social media stuff, I I try to to keep a pretty low profile. Um, you know, I don't. The, the joke is that I hate people and I hate everybody equally. And so uh, I try not to interact with anybody, but look, if you need to see me, you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter, the usual spots. Um, the, you know, you can find mine and Larry's book anywhere books are sold on audible um, anywhere you want. And the reviews are 
super awesome for it. Uh, and then if you uh, if you have if people have questions about you know writing advice or or general stuff like that, Larry and I host a podcast called Writer Dojo, and uh, it's a weekly podcast where we talk about um, you know writing advice and you know nuts and bolts of writing, no nonsense stuff. Um, and so uh, that's just uh, writerdojo.com, I believe. So come take a, uh, and that's available anywhere podcasts are streamed. It's also a YouTube channel too, right? Yep, it is on YouTube as well. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, thank you again, gentlemen, and uh, look forward to checking out the book. If you enjoyed this video, hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.